Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Another jump in COVID patients in our hospitals and a new request out to the nation's capital to help make room for more. The facility the city and the county hope to utilize in Military City USA in the latest number of cases coming up. But first, we've got late breaking news tonight. They've hit hard times or dealing with a pandemic. Now they're being told they're being evicted. Residents at the Jasper Mobile Home Park have dealt with fires, code violations, raids by the Bear County Sheriff's Office. It's even been called a problem property off of Walsham Road and New World Drive. Now residents are left questioning the flyers they received on their doors, telling them to be out by the end of the month. Take a look here. It comes from a company named Bear County Eviction Service and signed by Helen Clinic. The notice says the eviction does not fall under restrictions posed by the pandemic. Residents are scrambling for answers and a new place to live. I just talked to the neighbors and told them, like, I'm, you know, if this is a fake eviction, it wasn't handed to me by the constable, so I'm not going to do nothing. Then we received these ones saying that we had to be out by the 26th of July or they were going to take legal action. When the new management came, I'd heard about it, but, you know, we don't deal with them. So I don't know how we were going to hear about it, except for I was like, they're through other people. And now we're just we're going to be looking, looking to see where we're going to go now. One resident we spoke with says this isn't the first eviction notice they received. The first notice was given back in May. That's around the same time we learned the former owner of the mobile home park was charged with criminal mischief after he was accused of removing a water meter from the property and installing piping that allowed him to divert more than $9,000 in water. Our hospital capacity continuing to shrink tonight. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf saying a request was put in to allow Bamsey to allow COVID patients to be admitted into their military hospital to help with capacity. But they're waiting for clearance from Washington, D.C. Judge Wolf also saying about 25% of people in the hospitals are from outside of Bear County. Here's a look at the hospitalizations. We are at 11% capacity tonight. That is a decrease from yesterday. Tonight, 1,235 people are in the hospital, 389 are in the intensive care unit, and 221 are on ventilators. Bear County saw nearly 800 new cases for a new total of 15,880 today. The number of recoveries has increased to just more than 6,000, but there are still 9,600 people fighting the illness. And the number of deaths also increasing by five tonight for a total of 137. One San Antonio family dealing with the loss of a loved one due to COVID-19 and another family member on a ventilator battling the virus. Now faced with a funeral and the costs that come with it, the family is hoping a county program may be able to help with the unexpected burial. The night team's Tiffany Huertas reports. They were weak. They had a hard time breathing. 75-year-old Mary Jane Rodriguez died of COVID-19 on July 2nd. Her brother, 73-year-old Roy Lisario, is now fighting for his life. We will have to just pray for him because his, his oxygen level was going up and down, up and down. Mary Jane and Roy lived together. They were very loving. Their family doesn't know where they contracted COVID-19. I couldn't say me goodbye, mom, or nothing. I couldn't say nothing, nothing. I couldn't do nothing. Please wear your mask. Please wash your hands. Please stay away from people. The family is now seeking help from the county to pay for Mary Jane's burial. They take care of the funeral. They take uh, everything. Bear County's Popper Burial Program provides services for families who need help. Mary Jane's family says these programs are crucial during these difficult times. This is very good because we never know when it can hit us. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. You feel for that family tonight. We have a place for additional information on Bear County's Poppers Burial Program. Just click on the story on our homepage at ksat.com. And when it comes to younger patients, there's a lot of fact and fiction out there. Dr. Ken Davis of Christa Santa Rosa says this disease is not a walk in the park for the young, like many have assumed. He says while younger patients do have a stronger immune system, they could lose their kidneys in the process of fighting off the illness and need long-term dialysis. He also says they could need a tracheostomy, 
which when a tube is inserted into the lungs. That procedure would impact their ability to walk. And of course, they could pass the illness to someone in their family who could ultimately die from the disease. Despite the pandemic, international students here in the U.S. are being told to take in-person courses at their colleges or risk deportation. Immigration and Customs Enforcement argues visa requirements for students have always been strict and coming to the U.S. to take online only courses has been prohibited. Students may have to leave their colleges if that isn't an option for the fall semester. Harvard announced it is going to deliver all course instruction online. Other universities are following suit, which creates a challenge for many pursuing their degrees in the U.S. from foreign countries. If international students are able to complete this requirement of in-person classes, there's no guarantee their university would remain that way if the pandemic worsens. And speaking of back to school today, President Donald Trump saying he will put pressure on all governors across the nation to prioritize reopening schools. We want to reopen the schools. Uh, everybody wants it. The moms want it. The dads want it. The kids want it. It's time to do it. He says the Secretary of Education backs him up. First Lady Melania Trump also encouraging schools to reopen, saying the children are missing their friends. The American Academy of Pediatrics says kids should be physically in class, pointing to major health, social and educational benefits. But there is no one size fits all solution for the entire country. Public officials will be faced with getting children back in the classroom and keeping them safe and healthy and at the same time protecting teachers and staff. The Texas Education Agency is allowing for remote learning and on campus learning to happen as schools reopen. If parents choose remote learning, it does require commitment to a full grading period, whether it be six or nine weeks. The TEA's guidance also mentions screenings for students, staff and visitors before going on campus and masks will be required in school buildings with certain exceptions. In New Orleans, IB2 San Antonio Councilman facing backlash over their recent actions surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement. One faced with protests at his home for not raising his fist in solidarity, while the other is receiving angry emails from voters for choosing to raise his fist. The night team's Patty Santos reports. I am calling on you to raise a fist. The decision by District 9 Council Member John Courage to raise his fist during the June 25th City Council meeting, he says, sparked angry emails and calls from voters in his district. I just wanted to set the record straight. In a letter on his Facebook page today, he clarified his decision for supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. There's no manifesto, there's no crowd or group that I'm going to allow to, um, you know, ramrod our city government. I'm going to vote the way I believe it's going to be in the best interest of the entire community and with the understanding of my community. The former history teacher also explained why he supported the removal of the Christopher Columbus statute last week and his position not to defund SAPD. What we do need to do, and I've said this, is have better recruitment, better training, uh, more in-depth psychological analysis so that we recognize the very best people to serve as peace officers. Perry, you will hear us. Anger also fell on District 10 Councilman Clayton Perry in that June meeting for choosing not to raise his fist. The Black Lives Matter group threatened to protest at his doorstep and it eventually happened. And until your neighbors start telling you, Perry, what are these angry black and brown people doing at our neighborhood community meetings and they are going to be asking you to step down. In a statement, Perry apologized to his neighbors who felt uncomfortable with the protest. He added that to make change, quote, it is critical that we respect each other's differences and realize that while sometimes we will not agree, we are still trying to move the needle in the right direction. Courage urging people to take their anger to the polls, saying a vote or recall process has more power than angry loud voices. He says it also gives the majority a chance to weigh in. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. He's a man wanted on multiple felony warrants and is possibly armed and dangerous. This is 69 year old Carlos Robinson. He's accused of stabbing his wife and stepson. Police say the attack happened at their home on Ferris Avenue this morning. Both his wife and stepson taken to the hospital. If you know where he is, call 911.
A 39 year old man is facing a murder charge after a deadly shooting last night east of downtown. It's a story we first brought you as breaking news last night here on the Night Beat. Alejandro Vargas is accused of shooting 35 year old Andres Vega around 9 o'clock last night during a custody exchange. Police say Vega was with his wife when they went to pick up her child from Vargas, who is the child's father. Shots were fired on Rogers Avenue, not far from North New Braunfels. It's still ahead on the night beat of San Antonio family left to figure out life without their mother after she dies from COVID-19. Their warning, they hope you heed, coming up. And emergency room Dr. Robert Frolickstein joining us as hospitals continue to fill up with patients. Our live case at Q&A is coming up. And numerous statues now being removed, but there's a new call for action as a man says he was nearly lynched. The latest next on the night beat. Around America tonight, several statue removals happening in at least three states. Crews were working to remove a figure of a Confederate general, J.E.B. Stewart, in Richmond, Virginia. And in Salisbury, North Carolina, the sculpture of an angel carrying a Confederate soldier was taken down. In California, a statue of Christopher Columbus removed from the state Capitol building. His legacy is, of course, not without controversy due to his role in colonizing indigenous peoples. Tense moments tonight in Indiana. Protests continue in the wake of a 4th of July incident where a black man says a group of white men attacked him and allegedly threatened to get a noose. That man says he thought he was going to be lynched. The man says he and his friend, who is white, were headed to a public beach when the group accused him of trespassing. Bystanders and his friends recorded the incident and refused to leave. He tells ABC when officers arrived, they also treated him with disrespect. The FBI has now opened a hate crimes investigation as the county prosecutor says she's waiting for investigators to turn the case in for review. And back here at home, wear the mask. It's a plea from a father of four who is now a single parent after his wife passed away from COVID-19 complications. His life has changed both emotionally and logistically as he takes on more responsibility. The night team's Jaffney Gray has his story and ways others can cope after a devastating loss. Here one day and she was gone the next, you know, this ain't no joke. People think it's fun and games until it hits home, man. It could happen to anybody. Andres Garcia's life has changed forever. He just turned around for the worst and... Uh, I lost her. His wife, Erica Garcia, was one of eight COVID-19 related deaths Mayor Ron Nirenberg announced Sunday. She was diabetic and she just turned 41 on June 22nd. I still can't believe it myself. We all miss her. Erica leaves behind her husband, four children, and so many who loved her. You know, she, she helped anybody out that she could. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Sorry, this is something that no one ever plans for or wants to happen. No one can predict this, and it is traumatic. A lot of things change with this. Political psychologist Dr. Lindsay Beera says the changes include the reality of life after losing someone. For Garcia, who is now a single parent. That was my rock. It was my foundation, ma'am. I lost my best friend. He has to learn a new routine. She took care of the bills. She made sure bills got paid. She made sure there was food. Vera says families awaiting outcomes from severe hospitalized COVID-19 patients should prepare for worst case scenario. Start the education process. Get the ball rolling of what happens next so that it's not completely overwhelming. She might have left me physically, but uh, she's by my side. She's by my side spiritually for life. If you are in a situation similar to Garcia's, Dr. Beera says, do not be afraid to ask for help. If you like to help someone who just recently lost a loved one, Beera says you can help by reducing stress. You can fix the meals or you could just check in on them to make sure they're doing OK. Jaffe Gray, KSAT 12 News. The pandemic placing a strain on many organizations that includes Meals on Wheels, who's now serving more than 4,500 clients. Meanwhile, the number of volunteers has dwindled. Before the pandemic, the program in San Antonio had about 160 volunteers a day. Just last week, it dropped to about 29 volunteers a day. You can help Meals on Wheels by calling the number there on your screen, 210-735-5115 
We also have a link on our website at ksat.com. Another reminder, the San Antonio Food Bank also in need of volunteers. So our KSAT community partners have created a call to action to help get them what they need. They're serving 120,000 people a week. In order to meet that need, the Food Bank needs help for more than 400 volunteers each week. Without those volunteers, the Food Bank fears it may have to cancel some of its food giveaway events. If you'd like to help, we have a link to register right now on our website. Just go to ksatcommunity.com. Turning now to weather, let's take a live look outside with live cam. 88 degrees out there as we show you a shot of downtown. Very humid, very hot. Hope everybody stayed hydrated today. Yeah, and stays yes. hydrated for the days to come. Yeah, if you thought it was hot today, just get ready for the days ahead. Mm -hmm. Prepare yourself mentally and physically because it's just going to get hotter. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. First, let's touch on the aquifer. It's dropping. It has been dropping significantly lately. And today it's down 7 tenths of a foot to 659.1. Now, the significance of this is the 10 day average is down to 660.5. Once that 10 day average drops below 660, that's when we have stage one restrictions. There's a look at the graph of the aquifer since June 1st. It was in a healthy, healthy spot there, but not any longer. Now it's uh, down below 660 in just a you know, handful of days, and that average will be below it, and we will likely be facing stage one restrictions. So we can use some rain, and actually, we did muster up a few showers out there, a few downpours, highly isolated in nature, but they, they were out there on the radar screen. This is a shot from KSAC Connect on our Weather Authority app. Uh, from Canyon Lake looking off to the northwest around sunset. Nice shot of that thunderhead out there. And speaking of the thunderheads, here you have it. This is over the past four hours. We had some activity move through the hill country, make it to about Highway 90 west of town and start to fizzle out. So we'll take a closer look at this action. Highly isolated. It has come to an end. What we have here just south of, well, north of Uvalde, midpoint between Lake and Uvalde, bats taking flight from the cave there. But around that back cave, a few of those downpours that popped up and even one downpour and thunderstorm west of K Motto. Now you can probably see the lightning and hear the thunder. It's just across the Rio Grande and north of town, northwest of Canyon Lake. There you go. There's some of those thunderheads that we had, especially closer to Gillespie County and Blanco County. Bats here just west of New Braunfels. Of course, that's the Bratton Bat Cave, the Bracken Bat Cave. All right, here's a look at our weather pattern. We have this little dip in the upper level flow still. We talked about this last night. It's causing some good rainfall. East Texas, Louisiana, some of the Gulf Coast. They had some good rainfall today, especially in the Tyler area. Some good soaking rain that would be nice for us. We're close enough to, the, to this disturbance to have our friends in East Texas get the rain and get some good soaking rain but just far enough removed to where all we had were a few of those isolated little pop up showers and isolated thunderstorms that were very brief. Otherwise, the heat high that's off to our west and it's getting stronger from here on out. OK, this is going to be the primary driving force in our weather in the days ahead. So, of course, that eliminates our rain chances. They're gone. If we're lucky, we'd see a 10% chance tomorrow. Otherwise, not even a hope for rain or even much in terms of cloud cover, but temperatures are going to spike as well. Speaking of temperatures, today we started at 80, then we made it up to 99 for the high. Notice that thunderhead we captured on the time lapse there. Looks good, huh? The average high is 94, and the record today was 104. And I think we're going to be at that 104 level as we get into the weekend, and if not, then early next week. So highs today, mostly in the upper 90s. We did break 100 degrees west and south of town. Currently in Fredericksburg, 74, Junction at 77. We had some showers in those areas that uh, dropped their temperatures, but otherwise 88 New Braunfels in San Antonio and Catula now at 90. So here's what happens tomorrow, right near 100. I think we'll definitely hit the century mark on Thursday. Then we get above it. And as that heat high strengthens and really takes command of our weather, we're looking at 104, 105 by about Sunday, Monday time frame. As for tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the upper 70s to near 80. We will make it to 100 west of town, especially closer to the Rio Grande and the typical locations. Here in San Antonio, we're calling for 99. And in terms of rain chances, as I told you, slim to none, and that's mostly none. And I think it's going to be hard to even make clouds as we get to Friday and especially through the upcoming weekend. Just that sunny heat that we have. Mm. All right. Thanks so much, Adam. All right. An announcement made earlier today that the State Fair of Texas will not happen this year. So 
What does that mean for the game that they play on the state fairgrounds every year? It is the main event, Texas versus OU. Everybody circles that on their calendar. If you're a Longhorn or a Sooner every year before the season even starts, the big question is, will that game be able to be pulled off now that the Texas State Fair is done? We'll let you know coming up. Plus, a former San Antonio star has positive in the NBA. Coming up. It was good to see the teammates from a distance, but uh, you know, still see them and see everybody working and kind of, um, kind of get back to normal and try to. Rudy Gay ready for the NBA restart as best he can in big board sports, but first. Texas Longhorns have every intention of playing their Red River Showdown in the Cotton Bowl in Dallas this season against their arch rivals, the Oklahoma Sooners, despite the fact the State Fair has been canceled. That's according to UT Vice President Athletics Director Chris Del Conte. Officials with the fair canceled the massive event for only the eighth time in its 184-year history today and the first time since World War II due to concerns over the coronavirus. State Fair normally runs for two weeks beginning in September, continuing in October, and it always includes a Red River rivalry between Texas and OU. Despite the cancellation, Del Conte says the Longhorns are continuing to prepare for their game in the Cotton Bowl, scheduled for October the 10th this year. Here's what Del Conte had to say in his statement in part. Though we certainly respect and understand the decision of the folks in Dallas on their cancellation of this year's State Fair of Texas, we fully anticipate that our annual Red River Showdown with Oklahoma will be played in the Cotton Bowl, and we are continuing to prepare for that. We will continue to monitor the situation closely, work through possible contingencies, and make the best possible decision we can with the health, safety, and well-being of everybody involved as our number one priority. The Spurs only have one more day at home before departing for the NBA bubble in Orlando on Thursday, getting ready to help restart the NBA's 2019-2020 season. Rudy Gay used the NBA hiatus for a little self-improvement, which included reading the book called Atomic Habits, written by James Clear, that according to Rudy, tells you how to redesign your thinking and train your mind and how to create good habits. Rudy was asked if he can use what he got out of that book to help him in his efforts to reboot NBA basketball. This is a time I'm going to be away from my family, I'll be away from everybody, be away from, you know, normal, normal life. And um, I mean, well, what is normal life right now? But, <laughs> but uh, you know, just redesign my mind, you know, how to think and how to prepare myself for what's, what's to come. So, yeah, it's, it's been very helpful. I'm assuming it's going to be safe. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty optimistic thinking it's going to be safe. Um, you know, hopefully everybody goes in there, takes the proper precautions and be able to finish the season. All right, today is the day the first six teams of the 22 set to help restart the NBA season began arriving in Orlando, Florida at the environment bubble created by the league at the Wide World of Sports Complex. The Orlando Magic tweeting out this picture today as they really didn't have far to go, taking the bus to Disney World in their own home city, just right down the street. Magic are part of the first wave of teams reporting today, including Brooklyn, Denver, Phoenix, Utah, and Washington. Another eight teams will arrive tomorrow with the Spurs and the final eight teams set to report on Thursday. The Washington Wizards' Bradley Beal is also out on the NBA restart, but not because because of the coronavirus, because of right rotator cuff injury. The Wizards tell us he has been experiencing shoulder discomfort since early in the season and only got worse during the NBA hiatus. It started in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Former Warren High School star Torian Prince has become the latest NBA player to test positive for the coronavirus and will not be going to Florida, according to ESPN. He's the latest Brooklyn Net to come down with the coronavirus, including teammate Spencer Dinwiddie, who announced he has tested positive for the COVID-19 for the second time, and DeAndre Jordan. Both are not going to Orlando for the NBA restart as well. Breaking down the biggest contract in the history of sports next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL Players Association has escalated its demand that no preseason games be played in 2020 before they kick off the regular season. This comes after the NFL decided to get rid of two preseason games for every team. Games one and games four and in addition would not play the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio between the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. But in a blog, J.C. Treader wrote that the NFLPA agreed to a 48-day training camp with no preseason games after a rash of Achilles tendon and hamstring injuries followed 2011 lockout. Patrick Mahomes' record-breaking 10-year, $450 million contract with the Kansas City Chiefs is just part of the story of the richest contract in the history of sports. Before you add the final two years of his rookie contract, millions of dollars worth of incentives, it still tops Mike Trout's 12-year, $426.5 million deal with the Los Angeles Angels. That's after Mahomes led the Kansas City Chiefs to the first Super Bowl title in 50 years. Now the deal could be worth up to $503 million. Here's how it breaks down. Of course, the 10-year, $450 million extension starts in 2022. 
2022. 140 million that guaranteed due to injury. 2 million 704,905 dollars in 2020 season, plus a 10 million dollar signing bonus now in 2020. 25 million dollars in incentives, and the entire package is worth 502 million 631,905 dollars. And 32 cents. I threw that in. By comparison, Patrick Mahomes' $503 million deal after winning Super Bowl MVP and the NFL's MVP award, Hall of Famer Gil Brandt tweeted this out today. Coming off his first Super Bowl win and game MVP, Roger Staubach negotiated his own contract back in 1972. We agreed on a three year deal worth $75,000 a year. How, wow. How things have changed. A little difference yes. in pay scales. Yeah, you <laughs> think? <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thanks, yeah. Greg. Up next, our live KSAT Q&A with emergency room doctor Robert Frolickstein coming up. KSAT Q&A, we take our questions and your questions to local experts to get those questions answered. And we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, an emergency room doctor, uh, primarily at Methodist Hospital. Thank you for joining us again, doctor. And I, I want to ask you first a question about those who are, you know, conspiracy theorists. There are a lot of different things out there that the hospitals are, you know, it's the media, it's the hospitals, it's all these other things. Is, is that insulting to somebody like you on the front lines fighting this? Uh, it's, it's certainly insensitive. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the go what people's goals are, um, but I know that the, these are real people in the hospital that are fighting for their lives, and many of them losing that battle. Um, and to act like it's just uh, you know part of a conspiracy theory or whatever is frankly, I think it's disrespectful to those people that are struggling for their life. Now, Dr. Frolickstein, we obviously know that uh, hospitals here in our area are under high stress. And earlier we reported that 25% of patients in our hospitals are coming from actually outside of Bear County. To what extent are you seeing folks coming from other counties coming in? And is that causing a bit of a strain? Um, because these other communities simply just don't have the resources to deal with this pandemic, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that um, over the last week or two, especially the the rural hospitals are are seeing more patients with COVID and calling on you know the hospitals in San Antonio to to help them out and accept them and transfers and certainly some significant percentage. And again, I'm not sure the percentage of the patients at Methodist Hospital were transferred in from rural facilities. Are you seeing anything different in your emergency room? I know you said you said that, you know, maybe a slight decrease in the severity of the illness that you're seeing right now. But I mean, are you guys doing anything different than than you were doing when this pandemic began? Um, not not really. I mean, I think we've learned some things. We've learned that uh, it's not just about, you know, the oxygen, the number on your oxygen, your pulse ox. It's also about the work of breathing, you know, how hard it is for you to breathe, how um, if your oxygen level drops with exertion. So we're including some of that stuff in our evaluations. Um, and right now, yeah, I'd say we're seeing probably for every patient that gets admitted, we're sending five or six or seven home that either have known COVID or presumed COVID. Uh, so, but that doesn't, the patients that are getting admitted are still very, very sick for sure. Yeah, and speaking of those patients, doctor, the first wave was traditionally older people, and then things kind of started to skew a little bit younger. Is that on par with what you're seeing there at the hospital? I know that yesterday here in Bear County, we reported the youngest ever patient, which was 19 and 19 or younger, that um, that died to this disease. Um, is that on par with what you're seeing? Yeah, I think we are seeing um, the percentage of patients that are younger is higher now than it was in March. Uh, Again, I don't have the exact numbers memorized, but that is true. And we're, I think there's uh, five or six children admitted right now at Methodist Children's Hospital. So some, the, the kids are not immune from this. I know, I don't know if you worked necessarily over the 4th of July weekend. I imagine it's an interesting time to be in the emergency room at any major hospital in this country. Was it different? If you weren't there, did you talk to your colleagues about, was it different this 4th of July than a normal 4th of July? 
Um, I, I actually was not working the 4th of July this year, uh, thankfully. And yeah, I had a, a few conversations and, um, no, I, I don't know that it was a, a whole lot different. Um, you see the kind of injuries from people doing stupid things, but it wasn't a whole lot different. I want to ask you really quickly about PPE. You know, the Associated Press reported today that nationally speaking, countrywide, we're starting to see a shortage again. Is that the case here in San Antonio? Uh, not in our healthcare system. Our, 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 we've been told we have plenty of PPE for right now. Um, I mean, we're doing things to conserve it, right? We don't just use a mask one time. We use it. We sterilize it, reuse it. So uh, we're being very wise with uh, with it, but we believe we have a a supply, uh, an adequate supply at hand. You know, we, when, we, when New York was sort of the center of this pandemic, we saw a lot of people travel, including people from here, travel to New York City. Now that it seems like Texas and, and maybe San Antonio to a certain degree are, is part of this surge, do you expect or are you seeing any staff from other areas that maybe aren't as badly affected coming here. I know that they, we talk about ho staffed hospital beds. It's more than just beds. You need a doctor and a nurse and, you know, people to, to staff that bed. Do you anticipate that happening? Or are you seeing any of that happening? Uh, there are some, I can't remember the numbers or exactly how, um, how they came, but I know there are, are hundreds of, of nurses that are coming or have come through the federal, um, I don't know if it's the military or the federal government. Um, I don't think we're using utilizing any of those at Methodist Hospital right now. Um, but so, yes, I, I think there will be some of that. Um, I think the difference right now, as opposed to March, is that there, there are many hotspots, right? And so there's going to be, we're going to divide those people up uh, among all the many hotspots across the country. And finally, any final thoughts, parting words for our viewers? You know, I think in March we did a great job with the with the social distancing and the mask, and and I think that the fact that we did not have a big surge was evidence that it worked. And and really, no matter what you think about your your politics or the mask or statement or anything, I, I, I just ask you to to wear a mask uh, to protect those around you. Um, and, and it's really not so much about protecting yourself, but it's a it's about protecting those around you. Just assume you have it. You can be spreading it. And why in the world would you want to give that to, to anyone that you came in contact with? Right. Dr. Robert A. Froelichstein, emergency room doctor at Methodist. Thank you, as always, for your time, doctor. You're welcome. We'll be right back. Today, the first time Texas surpassed nine, excuse me, 10,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day. And by the middle of this month, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention predict nearly 2,000 people will be hospitalized with COVID-19 per day. As so we face a shrinking hospital capacity facilities in the Rio Grande Valley already at capacity with a massive influx of COVID-19 patients right now. One of the hospitals in the area, the South Texas Health System in Weslaco, set up a medical services tent in their parking lot so they could take in more people. The 25 foot tent is air conditioned, will allow them to treat an additional 20 patients. When it comes to COVID-19 and the nation, a new model from the University of Washington projects the death toll could rise above 200,000 by November. As ABC's Romina Puga reports, several states seeing a rise in hospitalizations. In just the first week of July, the U.S. has had more than 300,000 new coronavirus cases. In Arizona, testing sites are packed and labs are backed up. Robert Rosetko got tested at an urgent care in Tucson after showing symptoms. He isolated himself from his family and waited 27 days to hear his negative result. That specimen was sitting in a lab in Phoenix, apparently for maybe, what, three weeks? So is the test result even valid? In Texas, the U.S. military is sending nurses and respiratory specialists to hotspot San Antonio. We are days away from overrunning our hospitals. In Florida, where cases are ballooning, the commissioner of education is ordering schools to open next month for at least five days a week. The president pushing for the same nationwide. We're very much going to put pressure on uh, governors and everybody else to open the schools. This as the World Health Organization acknowledged emerging evidence around airborne transmission of COVID-19. 
particularly in close settings with poor ventilation. 239 scientists from 32 countries put pressure on the organization to change its current guidance that viral particles are only in the air for minutes. These scientists now say they may stay in the air much longer and are as tiny as aerosolized particles. It's a problem in uh, indoor environments, so in buildings and rooms where the ventilation is poor and virus can build up, especially if there's lots of people in the room. New cases tied to restaurants and bars have pushed several cities and states to roll back openings of indoor businesses. And as President Trump promised, the U.S. will formally withdraw from the World Health Organization next July. Joe Biden then tweeted he will rejoin the organization on his first day as president if elected. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. And Mexico has nearly tripled its number of COVID-19 cases and deaths since entering its new normal phase of reopening just last month. It meant reopening certain sectors of the economy under what they deemed the new normal. Meanwhile, the government had reported more than 93,000 cases and more than 10,000 deaths up until the beginning of June. Just yesterday, Mexico reported there have been more than 261,000 cases of coronavirus and more than 31,000 virus-related deaths, according to the country's health ministry. And Mexico's President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador says he tested negative for COVID-19. He shared his results as he began his trip to Washington, D.C. today. He said to meet with President Donald Trump to discuss the start of the new free trade agreement with the U.S. and Canada. Lopez Obrador is set to return from his trip on Thursday. Research is showing there could be many factors that contribute to who gets COVID-19 and whose illness is more severe. One of those may be your blood type. That claim is circulating online and is being addressed on scientific and even government websites. So is it true? Courtney Friedman runs it through our case at Trust Index. A new study shows blood type could play a key role in determining who contracts COVID-19 and how severe the illness becomes. There was a recent article that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago. Dr. Braveen Amalakouin is the chief of medicine at Methodist Hospital Texan. He says the study looked at about 1,600 patients in Italy and Spain, some sick in the hospital and some healthy. And they found there was some association in a statistically associated um, increased risk of respiratory failure if you had a type A blood type. Interestingly, they also found that if you're a type O blood, you are less susceptible to contracting um, COVID-19. Those results coincide with other studies done both recently in Wuhan, China, where the outbreak started, and also a decade ago during the SARS outbreak. The results are intriguing. There need to be studies on much larger populations separated into more groups. People who are on lower levels of oxygen, maybe one or two liters, people on a little bit more oxygen, and then those people on ventilators, and then people on obviously people who unfortunately passed away. There's still work to do, which is why we're labeling this be careful on our KSAT trust index. By no means, if you have a certain blood type, don't, don't feel that you're protected. He says everyone still needs to wash their hands, wear a mask and social distance. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight and another warm one, but just wait. OK, here's my here's another question I have, Adam. Yeah. Did we miss our last really good chance of rain for a while? Yes, uh, I think yeah. we did. And it wasn't even a really good chance, but it was something. And some folks got in on the rain, especially in north and west of San Antonio. A few isolated showers. I want to talk a little bit about the dust. I noticed that sunset this evening. You could tell there was some dust in the air and there is there's some a light amount of the Saharan air layer that is currently draped across South Texas and really a good portion of the state. But let's go through the forecast here for the African dust and it's going to continue to disperse and give us more of a crisp blue sky with just our typical summertime haze over the coming days and into the upcoming weekend. So good news there on that front that if you're uh, sensitive to that African dust, there's nothing to worry about from here on out. And we mentioned those rain chances and those showers. Well, we had a few of them isolated in, in nature. When we called for 20%, this is basically the epitome of 20%. It's highly isolated activity that popped up and most of it was pretty brief, but the few lucky souls that happened to be positioned underneath these brief downpours, well, Consider yourself very lucky. Some of what you see here, of course, are bats e exiting their caves, especially north of U Uvalde and right along the Bear County line here, the Brackenback Cave. Those are not rain showers, but northwest of town and due north, we had some some nice downpours, 
just southeast of Fredericksburg in Gillespie County. Hopefully that's good for the uh, orchards and of course the wineries there helps them a bit. 85 degrees. That's the reading right now. Dew point is 72, so it feels like it's six degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Right now, Bulverde, you're 85. Kerrville's 82, 80 even in Tarpley, still 96 in Del Rio, 93 in Laredo. Those are the hot spots right now, but even some readings in the 70s in parts of the hill country. So tomorrow morning, I think we'll have the low clouds in place again, right near 80 degrees, already 90 by noon, and then right up to 99 for the high temperature with a decent amount of sunshine for the second part of the day. Then we get into Thursday and Friday, still some morning clouds, but overall fairly sunny days, especially in the afternoon and hotter back up to 100 and even slightly above. Once we get into the weekend, we'll have drier air in place and that's going to reduce the humidity a little bit, especially especially for the afternoons. But the trade off there is hotter, higher temperatures and nothing but sunshine. We're talking wall to wall sunshine this weekend, all the way into the early part of next week with those highs back up to 104, 105. Mm. Look at Saturday on. Mm -hmm. You didn't even put a cloud oh, in there. Yeah. Nope. Be hard to make one. Wow. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Adam. Adam. On demand in depth with added perspectives. It's the goal of our new weekly digital program, KSAT Explains. Last week, the KSAT Explains team examined some of the ways this pandemic has had an uneven impact on our city. This week, we're continuing that discussion. Here's a preview. There's a lot of people who are working, you know, two or three jobs at minimum wage, and they're just barely getting by. Why don't we actually have jobs that are paying living wages that are allowing for food security? We have to have the conversation around a living wage. What does it take to make it in our city? You know, a lot of people talk about urban areas like ours, particularly San Antonio, as being a tale of two cities. There are uh, many people in our community that work, that their livelihoods are by and large intact. But there is a whole other side of this world, a whole other side of our city, where people are not uh, as fortunate. Now you can catch part two of KSAT Explains the Uneven Impact of COVID-19 on Thursday. It'll be available on the KSAT TV app on your Roku, Fire Stick, or most other smart TV devices. You can also watch it on KSAT.com. Well, it's set to hit bookshelves later this month following a legal battle. Up next, we're hearing from the president's niece as she releases a memoir involving the president himself. A relative to the president saying no one knows how he came to be who he is better than his own family. We're hearing for the first time some explosive claims about President Donald Trump in a memoir by his niece, Mary. ABC's Alex Perchet has details from Washington. Embarrassing personal details about President Trump penned by a member of his own family. ABC News has obtained a much anticipated memoir written by Mary Trump, the daughter of the president's deceased older brother, Fred Trump Jr. The book, Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man, is laced with several private anecdotes, details certain to embolden the president's critics and enrage his loyal allies. Any big takeaways so far? He has been known in the public scene for maybe 40 years now, but not a lot has been explored about his early upbringing. There have been attempts at biography, often dictated by Donald Trump and people that he controls. This is, though, a more unvarnished take uh, written by a niece who's somewhat estranged from the president and his immediate family, who does not have the same uh, glorified feelings toward the man. Mary Trump, a psychologist who's been estranged from her uncle Donald off and on, both before and after he became president is clearly tying this book to the current political climate. With less than four months until the 2020 elections, she warns voters if he's afforded a second term, it will be the end of the American democracy. Ms. Trump claims the president's reluctance to apologize was something he learned at an early age. The president's niece also alleges he and his siblings were behind a scheme that left her and her brother with a smaller inheritance when her grandfather, Fred Trump Sr., died. 
President Trump has previously said Mary Trump was not allowed to write a book because of a non-disclosure agreement that relates to her settlement with the family estate. But after weeks of legal jockeying, publisher Simon & Schuster announced it would release the book on July 14th, two weeks earlier than planned, due to high demand and extraordinary interest. It's ridiculous, absurd allegations that have absolute no bearing in truth. Uh, have yet to see the book, but it is a book of falsehoods. And while this book is scheduled for release next week, a hearing for the restraining order on Mary Trump is set for this Friday. Alex Brache, ABC News, Washington. The pandemic serving as inspiration for this colorful work of art. How a high school senior made this dress happen. Coming up next. Well, check this out, a COVID-themed prom dress. While her own prom was canceled, 18-year-old Peyton Manker used that as inspiration after entering a scholarship contest by duck brand Duct Tape. Four months and 41 rolls of duct tape later, she came up with this. She even made accessories like an anklet saying, this too shall pass, and a flatten the curve face mask. Wow. The duct tape maker is awarding $20,000 in cash scholarships to winners later this month. Amazing. I, yeah, I can't yeah. imagine a better dress than that. Yeah. No, it's great. And it's duct tape. That's yeah. the other part. I've always said the two best tools in a <laughs> toolbox, duct tape and a headlamp. There you go. Yeah. You can do anything. She had a lot of stick to itiveness. <laughs> yeah, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Team USA at 430. Waiting for it. Good night.